Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. And by coming, I mean uh, logging in, clicking on, typing in the URL. However you got here, we're grateful that you've, you're here. Welcome to Scenes from a Screen, Costume Design and Performances from HCC Drama. I'm Mike Flanagan, an instructor of drama at Houston Community College. And you are here to see live theater. We're doing some live theater tonight in the form of the Drama Practicum Class Capstone Project Presentation. Um, these are going to be a series of monologues and scenes and songs and design presentations from uh, Houston Community College drama students who are currently in the practicum course. Um, I'm not here alone, though. I have a co-host, if you can call it a host at all, and won't be wearing a tuxedo or doing any uh, costume changes. Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Snyder. I'm also a teacher at HCC. And um, we are here uh, for the practicum class. And what is a practicum class? Practicum class is a class that puts uh, into practice uh, the things that we learn. And so in this case, it's what our students have been learning in their acting classes and their uh, stagecraft and intro classes. Um, and so uh, normally we work on a play, a live play, just like you would out in the real world. But because of COVID, um, uh, everything like that has been canceled. So in order to uh, fulfill uh, the requirement for the class and so that our students can get some hands-on practical experience actually doing live theater, we're doing a live broadcast of uh, scenes, uh, monologues, design presentations, and one puppet show had some singing. Um, also, uh, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a link to the HCC Foundation's Emergency Fund for COVID-19 student support. And that's to help our students who are having a particularly hard time uh, during this time. So if you can give, please do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is all online. And as so many of us know by now in the middle of this whole quarantine thing, it's kind of a tightrope act when you try to get together with somebody online. And we decided let's do that, but then add a live audience and perform something. So. Um, we know that no one's here in person. We're not surrounded by an audience, which is weird for everyone involved. So please, even though you're sitting alone in your uh, home, in your car, keep an eye on the road, um, at friends' houses, six feet apart, wherever you are, applaud, scream, stomp, shout, all the things that you do. We'll keep our windows open and hopefully hear it. But the big thing you can do, of course, is uh, once again, go to that link on the bottom of the screen and donate. Give some money because there are people who can desperately use it. Now, Let's get started. Uh, first up, we've got a monologue from Austin McLeod. Hi, Austin. Hello, my name is Austin McLeod, and I'll be performing a monologue from Tony Kushner's Angels in America. But still, still, bless me anyway. I want more life. I can't help myself, I do. I have lived through such terrible times and there are people that have lived through much, much worse. But you see them living anyway. When there's more spirit than body, more sores than skin, when they are burned in an agony, when flies lay eggs in the corners of the eyes of their children, they live. Death usually has to take life away. I don't know if that's just the animal. I don't know if that's, if it's not braver to die. But I recognize the habit, the addiction to being alive. We live past hope. If I can find hope anywhere, that's it. That's the best I can do. So much not enough. So inadequate. But bless me anyway. I want more life. Thank you, Austin. Really good work. Some of these uh, hit closer to home than we'd like. Excellent work. Next up, we have a monologue from Aaliyah Barnes. Hi, Aaliyah. Hi, my name is Aaliyah Barnes. I'll be doing a monologue from A Streetcar Named Desire. I, 
I, I took the blows in my face, in my body. All those deaths, long gray to the graveyard, father, mother, Margaret, that dreadful way. So big with it, it couldn't be put in a coffin, but had to be burned like rubbish. You came home in time for the funeral, Stella. And funerals are pretty compared to deaths. Funerals are quiet. Deaths, not always. Sometimes their breathing is hoarse and sometimes it rattles. And sometimes they cry out to you, don't let me go. Even the olds sometimes say, don't let me go. As if you were, to, as if you were able to stop them. <sighs> but funerals are quiet with pretty flowers. You know what gorgeous boxes they pack them away in. <laughs> Unless you were there at the bed when they cried out, hold me. You never suspect it was struggle for breath and bleeding. You didn't dream, but I saw, saw, saw. Now you sit there telling me with your eyes that I let the place go. How in hell do you think all that sickness and dying was paid for? Death is expensive, Miss Stella. And old cousin Jessie's ride to Margaret's hers? Why, the grim reaper had to put up his tent on our doorstep. Stella, Bell Reeve was his headquarters. Honey, that's how it slipped through my fingers. Which one lets us a fortune? Which one lets us a cent of insurance even? Only poor Jesse, 100 to pay for her coffin. That was all, Stella. And I, with my pitiful salary at the school? Yes, accuse me. Sit there and stare at me, thinking I let the place go. I let the place go? Where were you? In bed with your Polak. Thank you. Hi, thank you, uh, Aaliyah, that was really great. Um, and next we have uh, William Co uh, Coronado with a design uh, for two of the characters from uh, Peter and the Starcatcher. Hi, my name is William Coronado and this is my costume design project. Starting off with my first slide, I chose to work on two characters for this project. Lil Slank, which is the character that I was playing for Peter and the Starcatcher. A little background about him is that he is the captain of a ship named the Netherlands. He hates orphans, but there is some irony towards this because later on we find out that he's an orphan himself. Um, he has a really nasty attitude. He's really mean to all of his crewmates. And his motivation throughout this play is his chess at everybody else's after as well. Um, my second character is Molly Astor. She is the daughter of a lieutenant named Leonard Astor. Uh, she ends up meeting three orphans, uh, Ted, Pentis, and Peter. And she ends up becoming this mother figure for them because she takes care of them throughout the play. Uh, Molly is a very smart and competitive child. A lot of the times she takes action to become the leader in the situations that she's put in. And we see that a lot throughout the play as well. Uh, moving on to my next slide. For Bill Slank, I decided to research what would a saber wear in the 1660s and the 1860s. I decided to include the 1660s because um, uh, it has that pirate uh, look that I was looking for. Um, and that type of clothing is called uh, slops, which are basically loose garments, such as baggy trousers, dirt trousers, and um, clothing jackets. Uh, a sailor in the 1860s uh, was most likely in the Navy, and there was a variety of uniforms that they would wear based on their ranking. And I found a few similarities amongst them. The uh, first similarity is that they wore frog coats with um, silver straps and a cap. And also they had this old lace on their sleeve, which uh, represented the strength they were in. Moving on to my next slide. Um, you can go out and buy a sailor costume. Uh, your best resources are online, such as Amazon, eBay, 
a custom website, so any costume shop that has a website as well. Uh, you can also go in person, especially during Halloween, since we do get a lot of pop-up Halloween stores. Uh, the prices for these costumes range around $50 to $60 a month. Moving on to my next uh, slide. For Molly, I decided to research what would a uh, girl in the Victorian era wear. And uh, starting off with an infant, uh, children would wear uh, short dresses to their knee. Uh, with aprons, bonnets, and button up boots. A change dress was a lot similar to child's dress, uh, except their dresses were a lot more comfy. Uh, an adult would wear uh, almost the same thing, except her dress would uh, go all the way down to the ground. Uh, they would wear corsets as well, and corsets would begin at the age of 16. Uh, often these corsets, these corsets were really comfortable for a, wo uncomfortable for a woman uh, because they were really tight. Uh, and a lot of the times these posters created as uh, fine injuries because of that. Moving on to my next slide. Uh, you can't go out and buy a Victorian dress uh, today. Like I said before, online is the best resource that you can go to, uh, to buy these things, such as Amazon, Etsy, eBay, awesome websites, and costume stores. Uh, while I was doing my research, I did find a lot of websites that are dedicated to making these Victorian costumes and uh, selling them, uh, which I thought was really interesting. The cheapest dress that I could find was around $25, while the most expensive one was around $500. But I'm sure that there's a lot more expensive dresses out there, especially if they're authentic. Uh, on to my next slide. This is my slide sketch. Um, starting off with his hat, I decided to give him a really big tripod hat because he is the captain of the ship and I wanted to give him a, uh, a hat so it would be visible to the audience that he was a captain of the ship. Uh, followed by a red bandana, a navy vest, a white cotton shirt rolled up, a red sash, he does carry a whip with me, so I felt like it would be nice for him to put uh, his whip around his waist. Uh, some brown pants and some classic black leather boots. Moving on to my next slide. Uh, this is where I looked up to see if I could find any article of clothing that I included in my sketch. And I did find all of them except for the brown pants, but I do like the pants that I, I chose because they are modeled after real Victorian pants. Uh, the only thing is that they are packing, so you just have to draw them to the appropriate down color. Uh, the total of this costume would be around $151.24, so it's definitely a little bit pricey. Moving on to the next slide. This is my model sketch. I decided to give her a subtle blue dress with some yellow accents, such as the yellow bow and a yellow sash around her waist, along with a white and then petticoat to give the dress some shape and some white tights and some black on the uh, boots to match the dress as well. Moving on to my next slide. Uh, I didn't find the exact dress that I was looking for, um, but I did find some similar designs that I liked, uh, such as this, uh, starting off with this Etsy dress. I really like the color, uh, but the only thing is that you have to do some alterations, such as the uh, neckline and the bodice, because these features are more towards an adult dress rather than a children's dress. Uh, the next dress is this dress from eBay. I really like this dress because it looks more like a children's dress. Uh, I like the color and I especially like the ruffles at the end of the skirt. Um, the Etsy option came about uh, $2,085.50, while the eBay dress came out to $100.50. So the eBay option would be a lot more beneficial. We're on a tight budget. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. And please be sure to donate by clicking at the link at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Thank you, William. That was awesome. And next, we have a monologue by Brenda Camacho. Brenda? Hi, my name is Brenda Camacho, and I'm doing a monologue of No Comparison by Joseph Arnon. Why are you always blaming me, Sophia? What the heck? You know, it's not my fault all the guys want me. Heck, I don't even want to go near them. I'm not into you guys. What do you think is worse? You walk around all day thinking you're cursed. Oh, I'm so cursed. Oh, so cursed. Life is so bad. Poor me, poor me, poor miserable me. I'm sick of it. What is that nonsense? It's got an old Sophia. You think you have problems? Your problems compared to mine are nowhere near what I go through daily. 
My family doesn't even know I like girls. You think it's easy to carry around a secret for the last God knows how long, not knowing if you're going insane or what? You're the only person that knows the truth. And I want to tell my family and my other friends, but I just don't know how. I know they won't accept me the way you have, and I don't want to hurt them, Sophia. I don't want to break their hearts. So I got issues. You, your issues are no big deal because one day you will find a man who will love you and take care of you and keep you warm at night and protect you and just treasure you. And that's great. That's great to have that comfort. You will have beautiful children, I'm sure, and life will be wonderful. So please, stop complaining about meeting losers because I'd rather be in your shoes if I could be. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. That was great. And uh, next we have uh, Megan Chavez. Megan's going to sing a song. Megan. Hi, um, my name is Megan Chavez, and today I will be singing Lying There from Edges by Pasek and Paul. I look at you lying there, sleeping so soundly. Sometimes I wish I could sleep as well as you. I lay bed in your dreaming I'm there. I look peaceful, and maybe you'd assume I'm lost in dreaming too. But despite how I try, to close my eyes and join you. Despite how I try to hold my breath and body still. Despite how I try not to troll to you or wake you. I can't sleep, I don't breathe, I won't move. I fulfilled. I look at you lying there and I want to hold you. I want to sleep for decades by your side. <laughs> but with you I'm restless, I'm running on empty. I'm living a life where I have compromised. You would think in my sleep I'd see you in my future. You would think in my dreams I'd see our kids play on the lawn. You would think in my nightmares I'd be living life without you. You would think, you would guess, but I can't sleep. So you'd be wrong. You have blue eyes, and I love blue eyes. I love how you're six feet tall. Love, how we question if God's really there. How we hate Christmas time at the mall. And on paper, we're great, and our stars are alive. Looks like it was all meant to be. But night after night, I keep shutting my eyes and I try, but I find I can't sleep. I look at you lying there. Sleeping without me. I bet you'd never guess. My restlessness just grows. And how I want to shut my eyes and know the things you know. I can't sleep. I can't breathe. I can't move. Oh, I wish I could wake you. I wish I could jolt you. I wish I could love you.
for wishing I could love you isn't really loving. I suppose Thank you. Thank you, Megan. That was great. Uh, when Megan and I started working together on that, um, she I had never heard of Edges, so thank you for introducing me to that musical. I love it now. And Megan will be back later. Um, but next up, we have um, Anna Cadiz and Danielle Williams. And when we started this tonight, we mentioned that this was originally going to be Peter and the Starcatcher before we all got sent home. Um, and everybody involved in the performance tonight was cast and crewed in some way involved in that show. So kind of in honor of that show, uh, and hopefully in an eventual kind of sneak peek way, um, they'll be performing a scene from Peter and the Starcatcher by Rick Ellis. Um, in this scene, Captain Stash and Smee are fleeing down the beach in search of magic treasure. Hello, uh, I'm Anna Cadiz. I'll be playing Captain Black Stash. Hello, I'm Danielle Williams, and I'll be playing Smee. That trunk is hard to find, Captain. So it is, elusive as the melody in a Philip Glass opera. Rest yourself a while. Smee will try to treasure down solo. Negroni, we'll trick the puling spawn and make M bring it hither. But how to do it? How to smoke him out? Oh, we can lure him, Captain. <laughs> Lorem, you say? Oh, stupid idea, Smee! Stupid, stupid! Lorem, yes, down here to the butch. Beach. Beach. In which case, we'll need a... Uh... A magnet! A really big one. That'll attract him. <laughs> Smee, Smee. I know your heart's in the right place, but... <laughs> Smee. You've been hitting this three bean couscous again. Oh, uh, Captain? Wait, I have it. Captain Stash? A siren song is what we need, and you're going to be a luscious siren, Smee. Whoa! Big croc! He's chewing all the scenery, sir. Not in my scene, he ain't. Spare me the theatrics, you reptilian ham. Abandon spleen! Scene! Scene! I, I think they're gone. I don't know if they'll be back again, um, but they were great, weren't they? Um, next up, we've got Olivia, Olivia Knuckles, with two very different monologues. Hi, Olivia. Hi, I'm Olivia Knuckles, and I have two monologues today. The first one is from Are You Ready by David Albert. I'm the food critic for The Times, and I'd been anxious to get my claws into the throat of that pompous, evil weasel of a restaurateur and rip him to absolute shreds. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not a vindictive person. I think I'm a basically decent person, but the restaurant sucks, honestly. The foie gras is dry. The lapine on crude à la brigine tastes like something my cat coughed up. The wine list is emaciated. Their syphilitic pastry chef couldn't frost a cupcake if you held a gun to his mother's head. I've been dying to get a crack at it, but they wouldn't let me in. But tonight, I was just walking by, and I saw this guy, normal looking, not a big celeb or anything, and he was waiting for a table, so I thought, why not me? And then I was offered a table, and I leaped at it. And now, that supercilious creep is going to have a nasty surprise when he opens the paper tomorrow morning, I promise you. That does sound vindictive, doesn't it? I don't mean it to. I'm not a mean person. I'm just like anyone else. I like a decent meal. I like to rent a few videos and relax on a Sunday night. I like to drive up north for a weekend in the fall when the leaves start to turn. That sounds like a horrible personal ad, doesn't it? Single female, 30s, enjoys food, film, and foliage, seeking male, 20s to 30s, for a profound lifelong commitment. Not that I ever, ever write an ad like that. I'm not desperate, believe me, I'm fine. But all right, yes, I would like to meet somebody, but 
I mean, I meet plenty of people, plenty of successful, brilliant, witty people. And well, all right, not plenty, but some, but they get the paper, they read your stuff and you develop a reputation. Like last month when I wrote that the new unbelievably expensive and pretentious sushi place downtown was enough to make an American feel a little less guilty about dropping the atomic bomb on Nagasaki. You develop a reputation for, I don't know, harshness. And you start to imagine what it would be like to meet someone totally new, like, I don't know, anyone. Doesn't matter. You have to be flexible and you have to be ready. You would simply have to be ready to recognize your chance when it came. And my second monologue is from Marion Bridge by Daniel McIver. In the dream, I'm drowning, but I don't know it at first. At first, I hear water, and I imagine it's going to be a lovely dream. Even though every time I dream the dream, I'm drowning, every time I dream the dream, I forget. Fooled by the sound of water, I guess, and I imagine it's a dream of a lovely night on the beach. But... A moment after having been fooled, it becomes very clear that the water I'm hearing is the water that's rushing around my ears and fighting its way into my mouth and pulling me down into its dark, soggy oblivion. I'm drowning. And then, just when it seems it's over, that I drown and that's the dream. In the distance on the shore, I see a child, maybe nine or ten and his sister, younger, five. And behind them comes their mother, spreading out a blanket in the sand. It's a picnic. And beside the mother is the man, tall, strong, with broad shoulders, good for sitting on if you're five, good for leaning on if you're tired, good for crying on if you're sad. And he's got his hands on his hips, and he's looking out at the water, and he sees something. Me. And he reaches out, and he touches his wife's elbow, who at that very moment thinks she might see something too. And then the children, as if they're still connected to their mother's eyes, think they might see the same thing. And with all of my strength, I wave my right arm high so they'll be sure to see. And they do. They see me. And then all of them, standing in a perfect line, they all wave back. They smile and wave. And then the mother goes back to her blanket. The father sits, stretching his legs out, propping himself up on one arm. The little boy runs off in search of crab shells or starfish. And the little girl smiles and waves. And then I drown. That's so disturbing because you know what they say when you die in your dream. Strange. But stranger still, I guess, is that I'm still here. Thank you. And just a reminder, if you're able to, please consider donating at the link at the bottom of your screen. Thank you, Olivia. Um, next up, we have a monologue from Lauren Riojas. Hi, Lauren. Hi, my name is Lauren Riojas, and I'll be performing a monologue from the play Pretty Bad. And I'm working at this, like, group home with Susie Harris. Hang out a lot. Know who she is? She is a lot of fun. She was supposed to come here with me today, but um, she couldn't make it. Bobby's good. He works at the garden place in Salem sometimes on the weekends. He, he wishes he could be here too. He's um good boyfriend. He would get a last for us. One of the great things. <coughs> it's just as hard talking to you now that you can't talk back. I can't ever say the right thing to you. You're just so not there. Aren't you? You always ignore me. 
I know even if you can hear me right now, you're not paying attention. You never. Why don't I matter to you? What do you want from me? Maybe you just want to be left alone. That's what I'll do then. I'm sorry I disturbed your deathbed, you selfish, selfish man. You self-centered, egotistical, pompous man. I don't care what you want. I hope you die. I hope you die real soon. You can rot and be eaten by worms. I hope worms eat you. Worms with big teeth and rats and flies and vultures. I hope vultures dig you up and take you out of the casket and fly away with you. You poor excuse for a death. I miss you. I've always missed you. Sorry. I don't, I don't want you to die. Chris, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please don't die. You're so small. Please. Daddy? Thank you. Lauren, that was awesome. It was really good. And next, um, we have Spencer Ravello, but Spencer's not able to be with us here today. So I'm going to present his project for um, Peter the Star Catcher, and it's a design. Um, so uh, Spencer had been cast as Hawking Clam, and so he decided to design Hawking Clam and Fighting Prawn from Peter and the Star Catcher. Uh, next slide. So. Um, one of the things I had them do was to look at the script and figure out from the script um, things about uh, the characters. And so uh, Spencer figured out, you know, uh, that both Fighting Prawn and Hawking Clam belong to the same uh, tribe, the mollusks. Um, and then when they talk about the mollusks, um, they know they live on a remote island. Um, they blend in with their surroundings. Um, but a lot of their chants and uh, language include. Uh, names like uh, pasta and um, uh, all, linguine, all, all kinds of uh, Italian and French uh, food names because um, Fighting Prawn had been captured as a young child, taken back to England and uh, treated as a slave and then um, as a cook. And so a lot of the terminology deals with cooking. So, um, uh, so Spencer wanted to use a lot of that cooking imagery in the costumes as well. Um, Another note, the move, movement needed to be easy. There's a lot of movement that these characters do. They are both the chief and the chief's son. And that the play takes place around the year 1885. So those were, and that these were natives of an island somewhere west of England. <laughs> Next slide. So the first thing most people think of when they think of Peter Pan and the um, native um, natives that are talked about in that comes from the Disney uh, movie. And so this is a slide showing uh, what our perception of what those characters should look like. And what's interesting is that they're uh, um, like Western American Indians, and interior Indians, not really island Indians like indicated by this particular script. So this is included because it's what our bias is toward that particular group of people. But if you turn to the next slide, this is uh, some pictures from the different productions of Peter the Surcatcher um, to kind of, uh, he wanted to look at these and uh, to kind of get a baseline of what's been done before this. And you can see it's, it's actually much more it's like South Sea or Caribbean island. And that makes more sense because um, the ships uh, go to an island in the middle of the ocean. Next slide. So Spencer decided to look at the islands in the Caribbean and you can see a map of the islands that were looked at to see what those um, indigenous peoples looked like in 1885. Um, and found the Tiano, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Arawak traditional uh, groups and what they look like with face painting, lots of shells, um, uh, the kind of patterns and colors and headdresses that were used. Uh, next slide. Uh, also, uh, obviously, um, Fighting Prawn has been influenced by uh, living in Europe. 
And like a lot of native peoples in the 19th century, uh, they kind of combined European styles with um, uh, uh, their native costume. And so part of what we have here is some other groups and what those native costumes look like, but also what um, Native Americans look like as they started transitioning into a more European look. Um, uh, next slide. So also the European look is also important, especially for the hat, which is the major thing that is said that um, fighting prong wears, the top hat. So uh, the top hat comes from the upper uh, echelons of society, which we have a couple of pictures here. But he also might have um, elements of the lower classes as well. And the picture on the left is what a lower class uh, family would look like. So maybe bits and pieces of each one of these types. Next slide. So the final design, um, notice that Fighting Prawn has the top hat, but it has been embellished with the sort of feathers and shells of the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. Also the uh, necklaces over the top of the kind of uh, Western type clothes uh, is in the style of these, for both him and his son, the style of uh, these indigenous peoples, but it will be made up of things like uh, spoons and forks and other kinds of eating utensils because of the heavy influence that um, uh, fighting prawn has gotten from living in England as a cook for so very long. All right, that's um, uh, Spencer's um, project and uh, he put in a lot of work and I, I'm very proud of what he's done. Uh, so next we have uh, Gabby, Gabby Etorte uh, with a um, puppet show. I think you'll really enjoy this. Gabby. Gabby. There we go. I think I'm on now. <laughs> My name is Gabby. I'm going to be performing an excerpt from a book called Dear Dumb Diary by Jim Benton. Um, I don't know if Miss Snyder mentioned this, but it is going to be a puppet show. And so I really hope that you, yes, that means you. One moment, please. <clears throat> this diary, is the uh, this diary is the property of Jamie Kelly School, Macro Middle School. Best friend Isabella. Eye color green. Hair color brown. Uh, <clears throat> brownishly blonde with brunette brownness. Dear whoever is reading my dumb diary. Are you sure you're supposed to be reading somebody else's diary? Maybe I told you you could, so that's okay. But if you are Angeline, I did not give you permission, so stop it. If you are my parents, then yes, I know I'm not supposed to call people goons and fools and halfwits and pinheads and all that, but this is a diary and I didn't actually call them anything. I wrote it. And if you punish me for it, then I will know you read my diary, which I am not giving you permission to do. Now, by the power vested in me, I do promise that everything in this diary is true, or at least as true as I think it needs to be. Saturday, the 7th. Okay, okay, I know what I wrote yesterday about uh, being happy with your own hair color, but maybe I was trying to be open-minded about accepting people with perfect blonde hair, or maybe I was trying to be a scientist or something, but today I decided to buy one of those hair dye kits you can use at home. You probably never noticed this dumb diary, but I have some hair issues. I picked the one that looked like Angeline's hair color, which they call glorious heavenly sunshine. I was not trying to copy Angeline. It just happened to be the first one that I grabbed. 
in the fourth store, I looked. I probably should have asked Isabella to help me with the hair dye, but I didn't really want to lecture from about self-acceptance. Well, I pretended not to notice she was afflicted with a rapidly advancing case of what the doctors call lizard lips. I just locked myself in the bathroom and died alone. Which reminds me, I know why they call it dye, because after you see what it does, that's what you'll want to do. What was supposed to come out as glorious heavenly sunshine came out the exact color of raw chicken. So now I had to go back to the store and get a kit that would dye my hair back to its original color before Isabella or my mom could get on my case about not loving myself. I pulled a clump of my old hair out of my brush so that I could match it at the store which didn't really strike me as gross until I saw how the clerk reacted when I handed it to her to help me find the right color. Luckily, they had the correct shade, and I brought it home and dyed my hair back. By the way, you know how the name for Angeline's hair color is Glorious Heavenly Sunshine? The people at the dye company decided to name the one that matched mine Groundhog. Saturday, the 10th. Monday, the 9th. Wow. <laughs> School was okay today. Actually, it was better than okay. Angeline got her long, beautiful hair tangled in one of the jillion things she has dangling from her backpack, and the school nurse, who is now my personal hero, took a pair of scissors and snipped two feet of her silky blonde hair from the left side of her head. So now, Angeline only looks like the prettiest girl in the world from her right. Although personally, she would look better if I was standing on her neck. Thanks for listening, Dumb Diary. Signed, Jamie Kelly. And that's it. I really hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Gabby. That is so wonderful and so much fun. And now we have a monologue by Abigail Pino-Flor. Abigail? Hi, my name is Abigail, and I'm going to perform a monologue from The Yoga Fart. I farted in yoga class. It was loud. And it didn't die. My heart started pounding, but it did not explode. I thought I would be devastated, but I was not. Instead, something unexpected happened. I laughed. At first, a little giggle, then a full-blown belly laugh. In fact, I laughed so hard that I farted again, and again, and again. Embarrassing, no? No, no, I could feel people staring, but I didn't care. I thought I would care, feel my palms go clammy, my chest tighten. No, I felt a lightness, wonder, awe. Who knew I had so much air inside me? My body had deflated, but my spirit had inflated. I waited for the self loathing to come, but there was only Stillness, silence, and in that silence, a little voice. I love you. Your body is amazing. I realized this is why I'd come to yoga in the first place. No, not to fart publicly, but to fart publicly and survive it. I know it's unladylike, but in the depth of this indignity, I found my greatest strength. Here I was looking my fear in the face and believe me, I had feared this moment. I played it out in my mind and it always ended with the ladies around me pulling hidden rocks out of their Lululemon attire, stoning me mercilessly, but not much happened. Here I was looking my fear in the face and realizing 
it was just a bunch of hot air and I could release it. I breathe in deep, so deep. Another loud exclamation erupted from my behind. Excuse me, the woman behind me said, but could you step outside for a moment? Some of us are trying to practice yoga. This should have destroyed me. This should have sent me whimpering out of the room, but I felt my calm breath heard myself say, excuse me, but I am practicing my fart nas and nas. Thank you very much. Then something amazing happened. A little noise erupted from another corner of the room. A few people giggled, then laughed, and then more noise erupted, and it was beautiful, a symphony of heart nas nas. I was free, they were free, and I realized in that moment, I was free of you too. can't hurt me anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. Great work. I love that monologue. Uh, Megan Chavez is back, everybody, and she is performing a song written by Megan Chavez and accompanied on the piano by Megan Chavez. Hi, Megan. Hi. I'm back. Um, so I'm playing a song that I wrote and composed. Um, it's called Truth, so I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Crocodile tears streaming down your face. Are you even trying? Looks so real, but I know it's fake. And I know you're lying. Is there a leak in your faucet now? Did you know you lost it? Is it too hard to stop it, baby? Don't cry. The tears don't look good on you, baby. And I, I can see them take off your face, but they can't erase your truth. so much for watching and um uh, just want to take a minute to remind everybody to donate at the link below all of your donations will go towards hcc students who are struggling during the COVID 19 pandemic so 
we appreciate anything that you're able to give. Thank you, Megan. Great work. And to paraphrase the Big Lebowski, that about wraps her up. Uh, but before we go, there are people without whom we couldn't have done this. It's a, a fun, exciting, and challenging endeavor. Tony Rao Sutherland and Nathan Hale from HCC TV made everything that you're seeing on that side of things possible, as well as a lot on this side of things. Donna Pinnock helped us put this together and market it, and uh, Carla Wells helped us with marketing help and design the banner. Who else, Kathy? Um, well, we have Anthony Riley. He's the Stafford Theater Production Manager. Uh, down at the Southwest Campus, and he helped a lot also with the tech, and he is the original lighting and set designer for Peter the Starcatcher, so hopefully that will happen again. Uh, Lorella Cobb, who is the theater production manager at the Central Campus, um, she's been doing this series of lectures with theater professionals for our practicum students so they can get their hours in, and that has been really interesting and very informative as well. Uh, Susan Hines, the chair of the Visual Performing Arts, and Dr. Colleen Riley, dean of the Visual and Performing Arts uh, Center of Excellence, have both been huge supporters of us and have really helped us to make this happen. So we thank them a lot for that. Yeah, and we have a hidden student. We have a student stage manager, Jen Mendoza, who doesn't come on screen, but she was here the whole time and there the whole time with Peter and the Starcatcher. Thank you, Jen. And thanks to the entire cast and crew of Peter and the Starcatcher, both those who are here tonight and who aren't, but who I'm sure are watching. Um, everyone at HCC who helped us in the audience, you guys for tuning in, or whatever you call it in the interwebs, and watching us uh, do this live theater practicum capstone course presentation. Um, remember, uh, in addition to applauding like crazy right now, go to that link and donate all the money. It's for a great cause. Um, Kathy? Everybody, it's time for your curtain call. Say hello. Curtain call. Curtain call. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.